Hello, I am Gregory Fedora, and this is the Fedora Files. Have you ever heard the tale of America's emperor? I bet you haven't. Well, sit back, relax, as I tell you all about the life and legend of Emperor Norton. Emperor Norton is both a myth and a historical figure. It's not always easy to tell where one begins and the other ends. So let's start at the beginning. Joshua Abraham Norton was born to Jewish parents John and Sarah Norton in the Kentish town of Deptford, England, which is now part of London. The precise date is hard to pin down, but most likely he was born on February 4th in 1818. Two years later, in February of 1820, young Joshua and his family, which at the time included both his parents, his older brother Louis, and his younger brother Philip, who was born in Voyage, set sail from London to South Africa, where his father established a successful marine supply shop. Over the next decade, the Nortons had nine more children. Now, obviously, they didn't have cable television back then and found other ways to entertain themselves, but I digress. You see, while John Norton's family had grown by leaps and bounds, his business fortune started heading south around 1840. Around 1845, Joshua Norton left Cape Town, which was well before his father went bankrupt and his father, mother, and brothers died. Sad, sad I know. Now, Joshua made his way to Liverpool in early 1846. He boarded the Boston ship Sunbeam, which sailed for Boston on February 10th, arriving on March 12th. However, Joshua Norton himself disputes this account, even though there is evidence of his arriving in Boston. You see, in 1879, a few months before Emperor Norton's death, the San Francisco Chronicle interviewed the emperor and penned a profile reporting, apparently from the emperor's own mouth, that in 1849, on the fifth day of November, Norton arrived in San Francisco from the Cape of Good Hope via Rio Janeiro and Valparaiso. I probably butchered both of those because I am bad at languages. Most accounts written since then have followed this narrative. According to his obituary in the Daily Alta California newspaper, he dropped anchor in his new home with $40,000. This last point is undocumented and sources differ as to whether the original nest egg was $40,000 or some other number, and where he got this money still remains a mystery because his family was bankrupt when he left. So no one is quite sure how he amassed 40000 or even $10,000. Whatever the case, it is unclear what Joshua was doing in the three and a half plus years between arriving in Boston in 1846 and then making his way to San Francisco in 1849. During this period, he decided San Francisco was going to be his home. No one knows why or how he came to that conclusion and where he was when he decided, hey, I'm going to San Francisco. Anyway, let's get back to the story. Joshua quickly established the Joshua Norton and Company. It was a real estate and importing concern. And within three years, he had parlayed his starting nest egg into $250 thousand dollars which by today's standards would be nine million dollars the dude went from basically nowhere to becoming a millionaire like almost overnight so then however things took a turn in late 1852 joshua norton took some bad advice it was involving a famine in china and the price of rice he was gambling on this uh commodity and he lost. You see, after years of litigation, the California Supreme Court ruled against Joshua and he had to file for bankruptcy. Now, due to being bankrupt, Joshua decided he needed a new role and announced his candidacy for the U.S. Congress in 1858. He, of course, did not win this election. And what if he had? Because when you hear what else this guy did, he may have been an amazing congressman. Now, by this time, he was living in 
Kearney Street boarding house. I've never been to San Francisco, but I think it's Kearney Street. And those accommodations were like decidedly well below the style he was accustomed to. And I believe this is where he might have snapped, but other people disagree. A little over a year after announcing his candidacy and losing, Joshua exploded on the pages of the newspaper with the following proclamation published on September 17, 1859. At the preemptory request of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in Music Hall of this fair city on the first day of February next, and then there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may alimerate the evils under which the country is laboring, and thereby cause confidence to exist, both at home and abroad, in our stability and integrity. It was signed Norton I, Emperor of the United States. In 1863, when Napoleon III invaded Mexico, he added the title Protector of Mexico. Now, over the course of a 20 plus year reign, that ended with his death in January 1880, Emperor Norton continued to urge those political reforms that he felt were necessary to secure the general welfare, and as he put it, to save the Union from utter ruin. Early proclamations calling for the abolition of Congress, followed by a call when the decree went unheeded by the army to forcibly clear the halls of Congress, the dissolution of the two-party system, and even the Republic of the United States itself to be dissolved in favor of a temporary monarchy seem remarkably contemporary and indeed a bit radical. Some claim that the emperor also called for a League of Nations, but the claim appears to be undocumented. But that doesn't mean he didn't. Just means we don't have any uh, written word that he did it. Now, predictably, given the scenario of a man suffer financial calamity, proclaims his own majesty, questions about the emperor's sanity trailed him. His biographer, William Drury, argues that, in fact, there is no single snap between 1852 and 1859 before which he was completely normal, but rather that there were signs of the emperor to come well before Joshua Norton arrived in San Francisco. As to what happened after September 1859, the travel documentarian Timothy Livich puts it this way. Some say he'd gone mad. Others say he'd gone wise. Most often using his preferred habit of the newspaper proclamation, Emperor Norton called for many things in the 1860s and 1870s that were well ahead of their time. And this is where it gets crazy, because the guy had some brilliant ideas. He was an adversary of corruption and fraud of all kinds, political, corporate, and personal. He was a persistent voice for fair treatment and enhanced legal protections of immigrants and racial and ethnic minorities. He demanded that those of African descent be allowed to ride public streetcars and that they be admitted to public schools. Remember, this is in 1860-1870 when he's doing this. He commanded that the courts allow Chinese people to testify in court and he pronounced that the eyes of the emperor will be upon those who shall counsel any outrage or wrong on the Chinese. He proclaimed with respect to Native Americans that any Indian agents and other parties connected with frauds against the Indian tribes were to be publicly punished before as many Indian chiefs as could be assembled together. He was a religious humanist and a pluralist who favored 
church-state separation and warned against the dangers of Puritanism and sectarianism, refusing to give his allegiance to any one church or synagogue, but rather he attended them all. He went to all kinds of churches all the time. And he prohibited the enforcement of the state Sunday laws, which he felt discriminated against Germans and Jews at the time. He also supported women's right to vote. He was a defender of the people's right to fair taxes and basic services, including well-maintained streets, streetcars, ferries, and trains. He was also an advocate of technological innovations that enhanced the public welfare. Another thing that Emperor Norton did was he set out the original vision for what we now know as the Bay Bridge. With three newspaper proclamations in January, March, and September of 1872, the Emperor called for the survey and construction of a great bridge linking Oakland and San Francisco via Goat Island. Emperor Norton was a man of contradictions on the fringes of society, yet in the thick of it all. He read the leading newspapers every morning, often in the afternoons. He went to a library to continue his reading, to write proclamations, and to play chess. In the evenings, he could be seen at public lectures and debates, and he often attended the proceedings of the state legislature in Sacramento. In all of these ways, the emperor kept himself well-versed in the national and local issues of the day. Indeed, his proclamations which could be visionary, were elegantly written and crisply argued. But the emperor lived as a pauper, eking out his existence from between the summer of 1864 and the summer of 1865 until his death at the Eureka Lodgings, a three-story building at 624 Commercial Street, where his 50 cent per day accommodations sometimes were paid by his Masonic brothers and former business associates. The room he was in consisted of a 9 by 6 area and it. He didn't really have much furnishing. He had a cot, a couch, a night table, and a wash bin, and that was it. Interestingly, next door to his accommodations was the Morning Call newspaper. And there was a young journalist by the name of Samuel Langhorn Clements, who we know as Mark Twain. He was one of the emperor's most empathetic observers. Now, despite the emperor's meager living arrangements, he had a strong sense of imperial style and decorum. He wore a regimental uniform, sometimes a Union one, sometimes a Confederate one. Often it was like a well-worn hand-me-down that had been donated by the U.S. Army base at the Presidio. He was often seen carrying a great gnarled walking stick. However, for formal occasions, he embellished his basic ensemble with oversized gold medallions, uh, a sword, and a beaver hat with an ostrich plume. In his lapel, he often wore a carnation, which was usually a gift of a day-old blossom that had started to wither that a sympathetic florist had given him. Now, he wasn't making any money, and to supplement the charitable contributions of money, food, rent, and personal effects, which to preserve his dignity he called taxes, The emperor eventually took to printing and selling his own currency in denominations of 50 cents to $10. Now, the currency promissory notes were said to be payable at 7% interest in 1880. The currency was routinely honored throughout San Francisco. The fact that the city honored such an oddity says much about Emperor Norton and much about San Francisco and its people. But you see, the emperor wasn't just humored, he was beloved. Theaters reserved some of the best seats for the emperor on opening nights. Accepting Emperor Norton in these ways was good for business, okay? In fact, a comic opera called Norton I had opened in San Francisco on September 17, 1861, exactly two years after he declared himself emperor. That year, The first local directory had listed him as emperor. The census followed suit in 1870. By the 1870s, he was being referenced in newspapers across the country and was regarded locally as part of the tourist trade. You could even buy little plaster figurines of the emperor when you visited San Francisco. But 
An incident in January 1867 revealed signs of genuine local affection for Emperor North. You see, a man named Armand Barber was a special officer, or part of the local auxiliary force whose members were under the oversight of the police chief and who often were called policemen, but who were actually in fact more private security guards paid for by neighbors and residents and business owners. Well, you see, an overzealous officer Armand arrested the emperor for vagrancy. Then, when those charges proved kind of bogus, he changed it to lunacy. Now the newspaper sprang to the emperor's defense. The bulletin editorialized it this way. In what can only be described as the most dastardly of heirs, Joshua A. Norton was arrested today. He is being held on the ludicrous charge of lunacy. Known and loved by all true San Franciscans as Emperor Norton, this kindly monarch of Montgomery Street is less a lunatic than those who have engineered these trumped up charges. As they will learn, His Majesty's loyal subjects are fully apprised of this outrage. Just as pointedly the Daily Alta newspaper wrote, Norton was in his day a respectable merchant, and since he has worn the imperial purple, he has shed no blood, robbed nobody, and despoiled the country of no one, which is more than can be said of any of his fellows in that line. Well, the police chief, Patrick Crowley, released the emperor and apologized. The emperor, for his part, issued an imperial pardon for the errant special officer. And thereafter, police officers saluted the emperor when he passed them on the streets. Perhaps San Francisco fondness for Emperor Norton can be explained in part by the fact that in addition to his holding forth with proclamations on weighty affairs of state and matters of human rights, and despite his own circumstances, he never lost sight of their most basic everyday needs. If the emperor felt that taxes or water rates were too high, or if he found on his regular rounds that the street or streetcars were not being properly maintained, he issued proclamations on these things too. Never mind that the edicts really were carried out. One of the most charming anecdotes about the emperor holds that the phrase queen or king for a day originates with him. That is, he regularly issued this patent of nobility to those, especially to kids, who had done him a good deed or he just seemed to think they were having a bad day and he wanted to cheer them up. In short, he, he was very kind and he had the common touch. Now, on a rainy evening on Thursday, January 8, 1880, the emperor headed out to attend the regular monthly debate of the Hastings Society at the Academy of Natural Sciences. As he finished climbing the last block and reached the southeast corner of California and DuPont, just across the street from the Academy, the emperor collapsed and died. The next day, January 9th, the San Francisco Chronicle ran on page two, on the top third column, an obituary with the headline, Imperial Ashes. Part of the obituary read this way. On the reeking pavement, in the darkness of the moonless night, under the dripping rain, and surrounded by a hastily gathering crowd of wondering souls, Norton I, by the grace of God, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, departed this life. Other sovereigns have died with no more of kindly care. Other sovereigns have died as they have lived with all the pomp of earthly majesty, but death having touched them, Norton I rises up the exact peer of the haughtiest king or kaiser that ever wore a crown. Perhaps he will rise more than the peer of the most of them. He had a better claim to kindly consideration than that his lot forbade to wade through the slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. Through his harmless proclamations can always be traced an innate gentleness of heart, a desire to affect uses and courtesy, 
the possession of which would materially improve the bitterful living princes whose names will naturally suggest themselves. Five years later, Mark Twain published The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, in which the character of the king was modeled after Emperor Norton. In 1934, as part of San Francisco's great cemetery eviction, Emperor Norton's remains were moved from his original resting place in the city's Masonic Cemetery to Woodland Cemetery in Colma, a few miles to the south of San Francisco. A reburial ceremony included full civic and military honors and the placement of a new headstone which remains at the Emperor's grave to this day. This was the tale of Norton I, America's one and only Emperor. Thank you for dropping by, and remember, as always, stay safe and keep searching. The Fedora Files. Check out FedoraCRT.com today.